the age of eternity. What the natural mind seems to think is in the future, but is, is in actual fact in the past. It's an age that has already passed. Because time is not like natural time. Time that exists on the other side is not like natural time. A spiritual age does not grow old and fade. A spiritual age doesn't exist in time. A spiritual age exists in the absence of time and therefore cannot become something new, erasing what it used to be. As we grow old, what we used to be no longer is. What we used to be becomes what we are now. That's in the natural order of things. It's not like that in the spiritual ages. The spiritual age may become something new, but what it used to be remains the same because it cannot be erased. The things that did exist in the past spiritual age continue to remain the same even as the thing itself takes on a new existence in a subsequent age. In essence, creating a new vessel out of nothing since the former vessel remains intact and cannot be removed. Is it too difficult for you? Is, is this concept of the lack of natural time too difficult for the natural mind? Yes, it is. But you have to to Jesus Christ to be able to grasp what he's trying to relate to us. Something which we ought to treasure. It is precious because I need to tell you that I would not be bold enough to come and tell you these things if Jesus himself had not revealed them to me. I wouldn't be that bold. I wouldn't have the guts or the courage or the gun or whatever it is you want to call it. I would not be able to stand here before you and I'm, I'm should I say, I'm warning you not to treat what the Lord is revealing to us with disrespect or lack of concern or lack of interest because it comes from the Lord himself. Not because I'm special but because he chose me. There's nothing that's good about me. In my natural self, I'm like everyone else who ever lived. I'm no better than you. The only difference maybe between me and you is that I try to follow what God is showing me and maybe you're not paying enough attention to it. You're just letting it bypass you. That's the only difference between us and those who don't follow Jesus Christ. When you're in your assigned course, it's like walking on water because we cannot do these things or know these things in our own natural strength. I wonder if you're still there. And I'm asking you, don't make me be guilty of casting pearls before swine. Don't make me be guilty of that fact. So I'm asking you please to stay with me so that we can get to the end of this, if you would. We've been off for two weeks, so we should all be more than hungry for the absence. Are you there? Does anybody agree with me? Or is it we've been away two weeks and so now we're rusty? What is it? Aren't we glad to be back in church? I'm glad. And the, the most difficult thing about my going away was my being absent on Sunday. But I'm glad to be back. And I hope you are too. This was the essence of all change in the spiritual ages. I wonder if you're there. What was the essence of all change? That creating a new vessel was what Jesus did when he altered the vessel. But that vessel remained in the same condition it was in in the age before because 
You cannot erase something that exists outside of the realm of time. That's the essence of all change and creation in the spiritual ages. No, if you're not mature, you, you won't be able to get this, but I'm going to say it anyway. That Christ made himself into Christ. Not that Jesus Christ is a created being. But he modified, he changed himself because he knew it was the only way that we could be saved. That he was developing a plan that could not fail to save those who are his. That Christ made himself into Christ, the prototype and the creator. Because the Father is not the creator. All things are created by Christ Jesus. Implementer of all that he had conceived in the conceptual age. All that he had conceived in the conceptual age. Not being different from the Father. While remaining the same in the first age, God existing in his glory. This was the essence of all creation. The essence of all creation in the spiritual ages was that Christ created all things out of nothing. That this is said to be this way since Christ left what he started with intact. If he did start with something, are you there? In, in the case of the beginning of the Rima age. Jesus only started with a concept and himself as the prototype. He didn't have a vessel. He created vessels out of nothing in the Rima age. When he moved from the Rima age to the age of eternity, he had to leave what he had created in the Rima age. He had to leave it intact. And that is why we say that he created things in eternity out of nothing. Because he left what he started with the way that he had created them in the age before. The essence of all creation in the spiritual ages was that Christ created out of nothing. That this is said to be this way since Christ left what he started with intact. If he did start with something, as in moving from the Rima to the eternity, or in moving from the conceptual age to the age of the prototype. Christ left what he started with intact, unchanged, and brought into existence a new reality. The total reality was a new spiritual age because the being or beings in existence or their quality of existence was altered while remaining the same in the age before you had two realities instead of one because neither reality could be changed nor altered since they exist outside of the realm of time In the case of the age of eternity, after all creating by Christ had ceased, each of us became a completed vessel in Christ, which we were not in the Rima age. The Rima age was the age in which Christ worked a sequence of spiritual works that would end in our creation, which would mean the beginning of a new spiritual age since we would continue to be work in progress, something being created by Christ Jesus, even as we became perfected in Christ. Impossible to understand with your mind. These two realities would exist side by side. You cannot erase any work in the spiritual realm since it exists outside of the realm of time. The fact that something exists that did not exist before creates the reality of a new spiritual age with different characteristics differentiating it from the age before 
which itself cannot be changed. We're nearly there. So I would like you to stay with me, please. Whenever Christ changed something, that change brought about a whole new reality that did not exist before. It is said Christ created a new spiritual age. For Christ to change something, he had to create something totally new. Even if it was based on what was already in existence before. Since he left the thing as it was. Speaking in terms of men. The vessel of the former age was the model after which the vessel of the later age was created. The latter vessel was more than the former vessel. There was something added to it. That's basically what the Lord wants us to understand. And I'm just going to, as it were, finish off by going over a few things that we all need to remember. A lot has been made of Christ living in us. Everyone says, Jesus is in me. There's life in me. And this issue needs to be properly addressed. We need to depart from ignorance and embrace Christ and understand scripture with the mind of Christ that is spiritually. I wonder if you're there. I'm trying to address this issue of Jesus Christ living in us, of the Holy Ghost living in us. I want to try and settle this issue once and for all because I don't think we have fully understood that this is an impossibility of impossibilities. That it's very impossible. What I'm asking is, can Christ live in us as we exist in this physical existence, in this physical condition of moral depravity? and our desires. Is it possible for the Holy God, Jesus Christ, to live in us? What is your answer? It's impossible. It's impossible for a Holy God to dwell in us. If He did dwell enough in us, we would spoil Him. We would alter His nature. And that's not God's plan. God's plan is to alter our nature. So that we become after the nature of Jesus Christ and God. Are you there? The only how that we can touch Jesus Christ is if we are translated to his level of existence because we have set aside our moral depravity. Are you there? That's the only how. But that's not the end of the road. That's just the beginning of the road. Any connection to God is through our translation by the Holy Ghost to the realm of existence near Christ. And I have chosen each of these words with extreme caution and care. So don't shift any of them. Near Christ. We're not in Christ yet. The Holy Ghost translates us to a spiritual existence that is near to Christ so that we can have access to Jesus Christ. We're not after the nature of Jesus Christ yet, but we are in a location that is near to Jesus Christ. It puts us in a place that we can have access to Jesus Christ providing something else happens. We don't speak anymore of our rapture or our ascension in technical terms. If you're speaking in strictly technical terms that are with understanding and knowledge, we no longer speak of the ascension of Jesus Christ in a physical sense, nor do we speak of our rapture but rather 
of our translation by the Holy Ghost since we have laid aside our moral depravity. We speak not of ascension, but of translation. It is not Christ being connected to us, I would like you to know. It is not Christ coming down here to be connected to our level of existence in the physical condition. It is not of Christ living in us as we live in sin in this physical condition. It has nothing whatsoever to, to do with that. We speak of our being translated to the level of existence of Christ and our subsequent connection to Christ since we obey Him and that obedience has to be in the spending of physical energy. It's not about a wish. It's not an attitude. It is facts on the ground that we're functioning in as we service or serve or minister to the rest of the body of Christ. I wonder if you're there still. First comes our translation. Because we're translated, we have access to Jesus Christ and he can reveal something to us. Are you there? Without moral depravity, this won't happen. And without the Holy Ghost, this is an impossibility. Notice, the Holy Ghost is not our Savior. The Holy Ghost does not reverse our nature. I want you to, to note these things because they are very important. So when someone starts to speak and contradicts any of this, you will understand who is sending them. We are able to obey Christ because we see the declaration. You see, the Holy Ghost translates us. We see Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus reveals something to us in a declaration that He wants us to function in when we function in a physical way, manifesting Theosebes to those who are physicalized around us. When that happens, we are already in a spiritual connection with or to Jesus Christ. We have access to the Father because we are in Jesus Christ. And that reverses our nature. Our nature is not reversed with the declaration. It's not reversed with our translation. It is only reversed when we are ministering to the rest of the body and we are consuming physical energy. You are consuming calories and a lot of it. But all of this energy is being led by divine energy because of a spiritual work. We are only able to obey Christ because we see the declaration. And I need to, to tell you at this point that the, the declaration is Jesus Christ himself. You see, Jesus is, is everything to us. He's everything that we need. We don't need anything or anyone outside of Jesus Christ. We've already said that we need the Holy Ghost to translate us. Haven't we said that? Our Savior is Jesus the Christ, the prototype and the deliverer. When we see something in Jesus Christ, called the declaration, we have knowledge of the work that Jesus wants us to function in. I wonder if you're there. We are translated to the spiritual ages by the Holy Ghost, if we have kindly repented. We are taken to Christ by the Holy Ghost. And Christ himself establishes and confirms the reversal of our nature 
as we perform the work shown to us by Christ in the declaration. The reversal of our nature and its confirming only takes place when we work the physical work and are connected to the spiritual work of the Rima age. Are you with me on this? Okay. I have a very important question to ask which I want you to pay very much attention to. If you've not paid attention to anything, pay attention to this. The question is, is our translation the same as the reversal of our nature? It sounds the same to the inexperienced ear, but there is a technical difference. Our translation by the Holy Ghost speaks of, addresses the question of our receiving the ability to see Christ in the spiritual ages. Are you there? Translation speaks of giving us the potential to be like Christ. We're not yet like Christ, but we receive the potential to be like Christ if something else happens, if we submit to what Jesus shows us. Translation doesn't make us like Christ, but it gives us the opportunity to become like Christ if we submit effectively with works to what he shows us. Translation speaks of taking us to Christ, taking us to the level of existence of Christ. It speaks of taking us to the spiritual ages so that we can see Christ and know what he requires of us so that we can attain knowledge, so that Christ can tell us by revelation who we are and what we do. I want to overemphasize this point. We are only taken to the level of existence of Christ. We are only translated if we lay aside our depravity. Carnal repentance is the condition for our translation. The reversal of our nature can happen if and only if we are obedient to what Christ shows us when we are translated to the spiritual existence. Translation gives us the ability to receive the declaration. If we submit to the declaration and work what is shown to us, then our nature is reversed because we are connected by Christ to the spiritual work in the Rima age, to Christ and to the Father. Our nature is reversed for as long as we are working the physical work that affords the spiritual connection to the spiritual work of Christ in the Rima age that is shadowed by the physical work that we are involved in. It's a mouthful. Think on it. Spiritual repentance is the condition for the reversal of our nature. Our, our being in our assigned course, which is spiritual repentance, which is not going our own way, but going the way of the Lord, is the condition for the reversal of our nature. This confirms us and establishes us in Christ. Nearly there. This physical existence, this life, is the darkness that we must pass through. This is physical condition and the things that are physical around us is what is darkness. Even though you may not perceive it as you think you walk in the light that is natural. The solution which comes in Jesus Christ is the assigned course, the way that is offered and given to us in Jesus Christ. I wonder if you're there. I need to know. The answer to the darkness, the solution to the darkness the prescription for darkness is Christ Jesus and the spiritual experience that I've just described to you. The way 
is what it is to be walking on water and going through the fire. The fire, the engrossing fire, enlightens our way and shows us those spiritual experience that highlight our physical life that hum between the fact of our physical condition and this light is provided when we are consumed by the fire of the spiritual age the darkness our desires encouraged by the catalyst the oppressor who remains the same totally oppressed and totally condemned to be separated eternally from becoming who he was designed to be by God which destiny he wants to share with you the choice is yours he's totally oppressed and separated from becoming who God designed him to be therefore there's lack in his life and that lack is what he desires to share with you by highlighting and reinforcing your moral depravity. The oppressor, the catalyst, desires to change us to become more like him. The way, the ark, the corridor provided by Jesus Christ frees us from this attraction. The darkness is all around. The physical existence is all around us. And the light provided by the fire can see us through. And is what directs our journey. The image is fire that's passing through the darkness. I don't know if you can see it. As Jesus Christ tries to lead you in your own life. I just want to give you a few more things and then we close. And again, I'm going to be saying a few things that are somewhat disturbing to the carnal and the natural mind, if you don't mind. These are things that would make people stop listening to the radio or turn off the tape because I'm, I'm saying something that people are not, not accustomed to hearing because it makes them feel uncomfortable remaining in their sin which would make people feel uncomfortable remaining in their religion that they so much embrace in order to give them respectability in their own life when there is none in truth as I was reflecting on the essence of what Easter means these things came to me and, and the question that I ask in order to point you in the direction that I'm going is, is what's wrong with doing this in memory of Jesus? What is wrong with remembering the physical birth, life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? What's, what's wrong with it? Is there some, because everybody is teaching that we need to focus on the physical life of Jesus, mind you. H have no, you know, th don't think that that is not what they're saying because that is the emphasis of the gospel message in many churches today that they speak on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what they're te teaching. All the works that Jesus Christ did when he was on this earth. And what I'm saying to you is that the life of Jesus Christ was a shadow, it was a parable of much deeper things that only exist in the spiritual ages in the heavens and that you can only see 
by spiritual sight of Jesus Christ. What I'm saying to you is that the physical life of Jesus Christ, your salvation does not lie. That's what I'm saying. You fix your, your eyes on the physical life of Jesus and you are on your way to hell if that's all you know. Because the physical life of Jesus cannot save you. I'm really getting radical now. I'm really getting radical. I'm not saying... Take note of this. I'm not saying that the physical life of Jesus was not important. I'm saying that it will not save you. That's what I'm teaching. I'm teaching that the life of Jesus Christ, not just what he said, but that everything that he did was a parable, was a shadow of greater truths that you can only discern with spiritual sight by looking into Jesus Christ in the spiritual ages, by looking into eternity, by looking into the Rima age. And I'm going to break it down for you. What's wrong with doing this in memory of Jesus? What's wrong with remembering Jesus' birth? What's wrong with the memory of Jesus' death on the cross? I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with the actual reality of the birth, death, resurrection, and the fact of Pentecost. I'm, I'm not saying there's something wrong with those facts. I'm saying there's something wrong with your memory of those facts if that is all you know about Jesus Christ. Are you getting it now? Have I made it plain enough? Or do I have to explain myself a little more before I go on? What's wrong with remembering Jesus' life on this earth is that it is a memory that is not based on first-hand knowledge, but based on second-hand knowledge. That's the first thing that's wrong with it. That is somebody else's description of Jesus' life. You don't know nothing about it. It's just what you are hearing from someone else. I wonder if you're there with me. And I'm saying that second-hand knowledge about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus cannot save you. How is on? Second, it is a memory of a physical event or sequence of events that are physical and as such can only be a shadow, not aletheia, not truth. Truth in the sense of an everlasting spiritual reality. Because Jesus died. He changed from what he used to be. But who he is on the other side cannot change. That fact is what is going to save you. Not the physical Jesus. The physical Jesus does not save. It's the spiritual Jesus who resides on the other side. And it's all the things that he's doing even now. In relation to our own time. That will save you. In essence, is what he has already done before the physical creation that can save you. But you need knowledge of it even now. And that is what is going to save you. What's wrong with a memory? A memory of Jesus' life. A memory is of the use of our natural capacity and our natural mind. Our existence must be extended beyond our physical condition if we are to be saved. If all you're working in is in your natural capacity, your carnal mind, your natural mind, then I'm sorry for you because you're on your way to hell. Because your natural mind cannot comprehend nor receive nor work in the things that are given to us in Jesus Christ. And if all you're working with is memories and your natural mind, you don't know Jesus. 
you have never seen him and you have never known him. To those who say otherwise, they speak of salvation by memory. They speak of salvation by the natural mind and it does not exist. It is not the prescription that is given to us by Jesus Christ. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, which is Jesus Christ. Our salvation has nothing to do with the physical existence of anyone, not even Christ, Jesus. Jesus' life on this earth was a shadow, just as everything else is a shadow of the greater reality that exists in the spiritual ages. Jesus' life was a message from Christ. I wonder if you heard what I said. Jesus' life, Jesus' physical life, was a message from the spiritual Jesus. His life, the walking on the water, his crucifixion, was all a message about our salvation. And a message that Jesus desires for us to see and experience in a tangible way as we exist on this side. Jesus' life is a message about how we may be saved. I want you to hear me please. This is extremely important. Our salvation comes from the direct intervention of Christ as he dwells in the spiritual ages and from his direct intervention in our physical condition as he molds our nature to fashion us in his image what he designed us to be in the conceptual age as he leads us from declaration to spiritual experience by spiritual connection in our assigned course not that his nature is communicated to us but that we are translated to his realm of the spiritual ages our nature is translated to his so that in our spiritual connection to him, our physical condition is reversed. Our nature is translated so that our nature can be reversed. This ministry is about doing the work of Jesus Christ. Irrespective of what anybody says or what opinions people may have, it is our duty to function in what Jesus Christ shows us and Him alone. After you've done that, you stand secure in Jesus Christ and in eternity. You have nothing to, to fear or to worry about. Because all is in his hands and already made. What we don't want is to get into forms that sound good so that we don't offend anybody. And I'm sure that many have lost their salvation because they have squandered the declaration that Jesus Christ has given to them. They have wasted it for fear of offending others or because they just feel it isn't worth it, because they're not interested, because they're not concerned. But we're not into forms. A form is a physical work without any spiritual connection to the Father via Christ. I wonder if you're there. So any time that you're just functioning in something that's copying someone else and that's not sent by God, you're in a form. 
if you haven't been sent by Jesus Christ, then you are in a form because it doesn't represent, it doesn't shadow something that exists on the other side. And we're not in forms here. And you can bet that we're trying to stay as pure as possible to the declaration that Jesus Christ has given to us. And we'll go to all sorts of lengths to make sure that what we're saying is based on what Jesus Christ has revealed to us. Even though we, trans we translate it from spiritual to physical, you can be sure it is what the Lord has directed to inspire others and to help others. Even when you don't want to hear it. A form is a physical work without any spiritual connection to the Father via Christ. A form is a physical work not resulting from a declaration. You're doing something and God didn't send you to do it. That's a form. That's not profitable. It's evil. It's hurtful and it's wicked. I don't have to worry about that because I know when I come, I'm coming in the nature of Jesus Christ because my nature has been reversed by this spiritual connection. And I don't have to worry about the consequences. You do. You have to worry about the consequences of knowing what you know. A form is a physical work not sourced in the Father in the conceptual age. A form is a physical expression not shadowing a spiritual work of Christ in the Rima age. A form is any work no matter how attractive it may seem in its physical form. Any work that is not the shadow of a spiritual work by Christ in the Rima age. A form is any work that does not shadow a work of Christ that he did in the spiritual ages. That Christ desires to manifest to the physical existence in a spiritual way. This explanation of the term form, my teaching you on what a form is, is just one result of our understanding of the word logos. That is why we are studying logos, because we have understood so many things from the Lord. This reinforces the importance of the study of the word Logos. And I don't intend to give it up until the Lord says, we need to move on to something new. In its spiritual form, Logos speaks of a spiritual connection that results because we have submitted something that Jesus Christ has shown us. That is, that is where the Logos comes from. It does not emphasize, it does not emphasize the physical act. It emphasizes the spiritual connection that comes with the physical work, which shadows the spiritual connection. Are you there? The Lord has given us many things. And we need to be faithful to what the Lord has shown us. We are responsible for what the Lord gives to us. We are responsible to share what the Lord shares with us. It is our duty as a Christian and if we say we are going forth in the name of the Lord, then it means that we have been sent by Jesus. It means that we know because he has shown us himself what we ought to do. And that because of that, we are in a state of cl close proximity to the Father, which is worship. Worship does not come from opening your mouth and speaking words if they're not sent by Jesus Christ. 
is not in getting up and singing a hymn that you feel somebody wrote 50 years ago or 100 years ago. What has the Lord revealed to you lately for you to come and share with the church? That would be worship. To worship the Lord in song does not mean that you sing an old, an old hymn or an old song. It means that the Lord has revealed something new to you that you desire to share with the church because it's on your heart, given to you by God. Worship has nothing to do with any physical work. That's just in repetition. Logo speaks of the spiritual connection that results from our obedience to the originator of the action. And this spiritual connection happens during the performance of the act. You can't escape that. You need to consider who is motivating you, who is moving you, who is leading you. You need to consider yourself. Have you heard from the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, maybe there's something in your life that Jesus needs you to deal with. Something to do with moral depravity. Because that is the wall that's separating you from Jesus Christ. That moral depravity that you don't care to lose. And that moral depravity is a sign to you that your relationship with God is in a state of lack, that there's something lacking in your life. The fact that you are morally depraved is an act, is a sign in your life. To you, not to your brothers, but to you yourself, because only you know how you are on the inside. It's a sign to you for you to change. It's a sign to you to indicate that you're not where God wants you to be. Because if you were in your assigned course, if you were in that way that God desires, I wonder if you're there. If you're in that way that God desires for you to be in, then you wouldn't be morally depraved. It's because you're not in your assigned course why you are morally depraved. Are you there? What do you think the way is? What do you think the journey through this life is? Is the pilgrimage through a life of crisis that we live our life carrying a natural cross from crisis to crisis? And that we be consoled and comforted by the belief that one day we're going to be safe. Jesus' intention is not to console you and comfort you. His desire is to call you onwards and upwards in Him. His desire is to challenge you. It's to show you how we fail so that we can overcome those failures. Are you there? You can't be living your life on the basis of one day you want to see Jesus. How do you know you're going to see Jesus if you're not seeing him now? If you are not receiving knowledge from Jesus Christ, if you don't have, if all you have is an electronic relationship, a relationship with video games and the TV and email, if all your relationship is with your computer, do you expect to see Jesus Christ soon? Don't expect to see Jesus Christ one day if you're not seeing him now. If you're not following him day by day. 
What is the way of the Lord? Is, is it some fictitious thing that Brother Sam has been talking about? Is it something just hanging in the air? Like our journey through life. Like you are small, you grow big, then you get old and you die. It's like your journey through life. It's being in the way an idea that we imagine and pretend that somehow we are serving God. We don't know exactly how, but we believe deep down inside that we are serving God. It's not, that's not the way. We're not exactly sure, but I believe that this is, no. That's not the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is all those dots, all those spiritual encounters, all those spiritual connections that you have with Jesus Christ that come together and make the way. The things that are in between your physical condition, Jesus wants to remove all your sidestepping and your walking naturally. Jesus wants to erase so that he no longer sees them and all he sees is his son walking by faith in this spiritual experience in this life. Jesus does not want to know about your physical condition. Don't tell him. Don't try and tell him what on your faith and on your sin. He does not want to know. All he wants to know is about your experiences with him. That is what he desires to take to the Father. Not your physical condition. Not your carnal sin. Not your filthiness. It says, lay it aside. Don't take up your sin and tell Jesus, Lord, you see me doing so. No! As a matter of fact, stop talking to Jesus and walk in Jesus. Allow him to lead you in these physical deeds that are his. So that he can take these deeds back to the Father and say, look, this is your son. This is what you planned. And look, this is exactly what he did. Exactly what you wanted, even though I did it. Because we can't do it. But the Father will pass it as if we did it. If we are connected to Jesus when Jesus does it. That's the way. When all these spiritual encounters these spiritual connections are moved close to each other and they're both and they make sense one right behind the others Jesus erasing all the gaps in between because of all sidestepping that's the assigned course The way of the Lord is a journey. It's a pilgrimage that is defined by Christ. There are limitations, very specific limitations as to what God's will is. That is why he told the prophets, write it down because I don't want you walking this thing from your mind. That we are very much aware of what God's will is. Where God's will ends and where the oppressors begins our own. And that we stay within the confines and the boundaries of what God shows us in Jesus Christ. What makes it the way of the Lord is that Christ Jesus defines what we should be doing in that way. From stop to stop. This is what makes it his way. If he doesn't define it, define each stop along the way, if he doesn't define it and lead us in that spiritual work, then it's not his way. The way of the Lord is a reflection of of the move of Christ that took place in the Rima age. 
Ephesians 5.26 The washing of the water indicates the flow, the move of Christ. The way is our life being structured by that move that has already taken place in the remage. A flow that has already flowed. A flow that has already passed by. A flow that has already been accomplished by Christ in his move in the remage. The way is the implementation of the order of our spiritual creation is the implementation of the order of our creation as a spiritual being in the real age and the implementation of this order in our lives as we survive through this oppressive age no matter how you turn it the way is the execution of the order of the real age in each of our lives as we live out our physical lives in this oppressive age. It's very simple. The way is a shadow of all the things that Jesus Christ did in order to bring us to a state of completion at the beginning of the age of eternity. The way is simply a shadow of what Jesus Christ did in order to create us as spiritual creations in the Rima age and it is reflected, it is shadowed in physical works that we walk in this life the way is defined by Christ according to the dough bowl we are the losers we are the losers if we are not in the way of the Lord. If we are not experiencing these spiritual connex connections to Jesus Christ, then we are the losers. Jesus is not the lo loser. He, he's already safe and secure in himself as God in the age of glory. He doesn't need anything. But he desires to share that glory with us. We would be the losers if we fail to commit ourselves to this way at the expense of our own moral depravity. Jesus has nothing to lose. We have everything to lose. And none of you can say, Brother Sam didn't try to reach us. None of you can say, Brother Sam did not speak what the Lord showed him. Because when you say to Jesus, he can say, but you forget I am the originator. You forget I am the one who knew all I gave him to say. You and you're not going to be able to accuse me before Jesus Christ. And I hope... And I wish, with everything in my being, that you would not stand before Jesus Christ and try to defend yourselves. Because your case can be very weak. If the people down the road didn't, didn't have much to go on, all of you have everything to go on. If the people on the road were not taught, that might be an excuse which is not going to work. You all don't have any excuse. You have an excuse because you've been taught everything that you're supposed to hear. Even in a physical way. And the rest is up to you. Because after I know 
that I come here on Sunday and reveal to you what the Lord has shown to me. 